Hey everyone, welcome back to Indicted TV. I am your host, Negra. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and follow us on Instagram. Before we start, I want to give a big shout out to our sponsors, Royalty Honey, for sponsoring us. I'm going to give you one of these little boxes. I would love to. I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So on today's episode, we have Mohawk Matt. Welcome to Indict It. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I've been wanting to be here for a while. Yes. Don't be nervous. You no. know, we got this. All right. So before, well, just let us know where you grew up, where you're from. Not where you're from, but, you know, where your area where you grew up, your I, family, brothers, sisters, how your house was when you were growing up. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, uh, the east, I guess the east, northeast side of the San Fernando Valley. Grew up between Mission Hills and Sun Valley. Um, I had like a middle class white, technically lower, lower to middle class white family mm -hmm. growing up in the city of Mission Hills. And uh, I got a brother. He's not really a, he's always done the opposite of me, normal kid. I had good parents, uh, good. hardworking parents. Dad was in the military. Um, uh, was he strict? Yeah, my dad was one of those guys I hardly ever heard I love you. He was strict, but like, I don't, not not that strict. Okay. You know, he was all right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I grew up in the valley. Uh, everything I've learned and done bad and good was in the valley for the most part. So. You're a valley boy. I'm a total San Fernando Valley boy. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's Always. right. So you only have one brother? I have one brother, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you... Where did you finish elementary, junior high? I went to St. Ferdinand's Elementary Catholic School in San Fernando. Uh, got kicked out, went to Holmes Junior High. Okay. Um, Holmes Junior High, the switch to the public school system is where things got a little little different. I got involved in graffiti at a really young age. Uh, what age? Well, tell us. Like 13, maybe, junior high, beginning. Oh. I left uh, elementary school around seventh grade, so rushed into eighth grade into, into the public school system. I, uh, I got into graffiti immediately. Oh. And it was, my life had immediately found something it loved right there at that point. Graffiti. Right in walls. Yeah. Graffiti in the 90s, though, was a lot different than it is today. It was huge. It was breathtaking. I mean, I can still smell spray paint on the 405 freeway in the middle of the night. Like, I, like my mind was just, I was in love with graffiti. And it, it, again, it, it's extremely different, that graffiti era, than today. Today, it's extremely easy for kids to get involved in graffiti, to do graffiti, um, the supplies are made for you. They're sold in stores. We used to have to steal them or make them ourselves. We would get chased and shot at by gang members, cops, business owners. Today, graffiti is so accepted, it's, it's everywhere. And it's easy to do. And in a way, it's good so that so many kids don't get in trouble. True. And, you know, and, start, and open this whole new career, going to jail career, which yeah. definitely changes so yeah, many lives. In our days, if you go to jail for graffiti, you're, you're getting you're in some trouble with all the gang members. It was not accepted. Oh. Yeah, it, was, it was not accepted back in the 90s. Oh. Yeah. So obviously it's way different, like I said, for these kids. And yeah. they obviously get a you know slap in the hand, yeah. probably, or depending on how many I times. I honestly don't even think the cops arrest them because it's so common. Like, it's so, I mean, I don't know how bad this is going to sound, but I'm, uh, uh, I still lately, I've been going back out graffiti because it's, it's, I can pick it up simply and not be bothered. Oh, and it's God. kind of fun, yeah. And, it, and it's probably like therapeutic. It is because it's, and it's nostalgic. It's therapeutic, and I can relive my 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 younger years and and graffiti. It's nice to be able to go out and not have to be terrified of what's coming, and that's just enjoy good. it and 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 it be fun. So nice, yeah. nice. So that's when you were thirteen years old. Is that started. how you started getting in trouble? Because obviously you're unindicted, you know. I would say yeah, that's when I started. I mean, I've always been like kind of. I've always been the kind of kid because, well, the truth about me is I'm I'm one of a few white boys that grew up with Mexicans. Okay. Even in elementary school in San Fernando, my private elementary school was all Mexicans, maybe two white boys. And that was so you. I've always been like a white boy, but I grew up a Mexican. Mm -hmm. So like I'm saying, I had all those friends and I was more into that lifestyle. So graffiti came easy. I was playing soccer and baseball with all Mexicans. And so I've always had like people that were into the other lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I've always had homies that were in gangs at a young age. And I was always extremely interested in it. Yeah. Extremely like drawn to that. Starting with the graffiti. The, with graffiti crews in the 90s were just like a gang. Yeah. It's a group of us together that had each other's back. Mm -hmm. So that lifestyle was always very interesting to me. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously, you're able to do it now and be, you know, use it for therapy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, as a young child, young, young teen, yeah. did you ever go to juvenile hall? I did. I got arrested when I went to, when I went to my junior high. I uh, had the bright idea to show off to my friends. One of my friends from a... Uh, from one of the gangs by my house who I was hanging out with gave me a butterfly knife. Now, you remember the old school butterfly knives? That like the little flip, ones, yeah. would flip around, you could do the, I had the bright idea to bring this to junior high to impress a bunch of my friends and I got someone told on me. 
and I got arrested. 13 and a half, I think I got arrested. When they didn't even give me the chance to call my parents. They just <gasps> had me arrested at the school, transported me to juvenile hall. So you went to like a I went Silmar? To Silmar Juvenile Hall, yep. Um, how was that little experience for you, like walking in, it's your first time, like you it's don't know. It's going to sound horrible and I'm not trying to glorify it, but when you're a 13 year old kid and, and you're kind of into graffiti and you hit the juvenile hall system and you're just like, all right. Oh, so you were cool with it. I was like, it was interesting. It was fun. I didn't have fear of stuff like that. Oh. Mind you, because like I said, I'm, I'm a white boy, but I grew up with homies. So I'm like, this is like, I've already heard the stories. I'm getting used to stuff like, and some of them had already been through it. So I'm like, okay, it's just my turn. It's just my turn to go show off and make a name for myself. And Juvenile Hall in the nine, in the early early 90s, late 80s was, it was fun. It was fun. And I didn't, I wasn't going in with a bunch of enemies being from a gang. I wasn't from a gang yet. Okay. So yes. I didn't have a bunch of enemies. So me going to Juvenile Hall was fun. You were just a white boy. Just a white boy. You know what I mean? And <laughs> going I, and in I, for a freaking... And, and I fit was... in. You could tell I'm a white boy, but you also could tell, oh, this guy's a little different. He kind of grew up over here. Yes. So like I, I blended in. For me, it was fun. Okay. You know? How long did you end up doing? Probably like a, maybe a week. And ah, my mom picked yeah. me up. Yeah, I went to court and they released me to my mom. And what did your parents tell you? Oh, they were furious. Oh, oh I, I could imagine. It. I got it at home. I got it at home. Yeah. Super whoop. So, uh, my dad really wasn't a hitter. Like, I think I got hit maybe a total of four times. By but your dad. Were, yeah, but I tell kids today they get away with murder. In my day, my dad wasn't abusive, but if I got smacked, I deserved it. Yeah. And I just dealt with it. You just knew you had that coming and it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. So. I mean, my mom wasn't abusive, but she hit me. Oh, I got smacked. Like, like yeah. every day. <laughs> it was like Dude, something. I remember calling my mom a bitch at Thanksgiving <gasps> and I was off the table. I didn't even know what race I was. I was on the floor like this. What happened? Before I even came to, I remember. <gasps> And my dad was like, don't you ever talk to your mom oh, again. Yeah. And I have to say, being a grown-up, uh, I had that. Up. Yeah, you don't you call your mom a b no. At Thanksgiving that she I made. I tied your ass up. Bro, and that was like one of four <laughs> times in a whole life. So I wasn't abused. No, my, my, my dad gave it to me if I had it coming. So. He, probably, he probably gave it to you in a different form, like wait, just be more serious or not talking. Yeah, but it got like to that, a huh? point where if I saw him go like this, oh, man, I already went too far. I'm sorry, Dad. Uh, yeah, you, you learn. Know, you you learn. You yeah. knew. Yeah. All right, so you get out, and you're only there for a week. So you thought you were, you went back to school, and you thought you were the coolest. I came back thinking I was the shit. Ah, so oh, you know that I'm walking a little taller, my dickies fit a little, a little better, <laughs> my white t-shirts a little more creased, and I'm just like, that's right. You know? Oh uh, shit! I come yeah. home like Joe Morgan in American Me. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. yeah. On a whole one week. On a whole, yeah, a whole one week. A yeah, hard time. Hard time in juvenile hall with peanut butter and jelly. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so you came uh, home. You're back to school. Back to school. Graffiti, graffiti continues and grows. And okay. me, I was playing sports. I was really good at baseball. And I was... You played, you played baseball at school? I played baseball in a, a Mission Hills Little League in the Valley. Okay, so at the yeah. park, not at, at school. At the park. No, like at, at one of those places where it's like set up for leagues and no, stuff. No, no, I get that. But what yeah. I guess what I'm trying to say is like if you play for, if you're playing in school, that means you did well at well, I did. Grades. I ended up, as I grew through junior high to Granada Hills High School, where I went to high school, I st kept playing soccer and baseball. I was a little bit better at baseball, so I stuck with that. So you had good grades. I had, believe it or not, I was a, I was a cluster growing up. I was into gothic punk rock, rode a skateboard, graffiti, and I'm hanging out with gang members. Picture that, and I played sports. Oh, yeah, you're a sick-ass fool. I'm messed up. I'm all messed up. All messed up. Yeah. All messed up. No, no. That, yeah, that's But quick. that was the 80s, 90s cusp right there to where if you grew up in that era... There was just a lot going on, mm -hmm. and I was into a few things at once. Hey, but I mean, at least you're into a lot of different things and not just like one thing and yeah. just like destroying yeah. it. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So you're playing sports. You're in high school. You haven't got. You didn't get in trouble anymore. Yeah, after I had that. a couple more small arrests. I think. For yeah, graffiti, but nothing but major. But nothing major. You go to juvenile hall for a couple of weeks. Come home. I think I went to camp once or twice. But How was your camp experience? Oh, it was fun. I went to Camp Miller in Malibu. Oh, I think shit. it was for graffiti again. There, there was an officer who was investigating me and my friends, our whole tagging crew, before we connected to a gang. And, you know, I went for like three months, had fun. Juvenile Hall was fun for me. But did you fight in there? I had a couple fist fights, yeah. Nothing major, nothing major. What would you say was like the craziest thing you saw, like, at Ju at, you know, at Juvenile Hall or any of these camps that you were? Um, I think I saw a couple like like major jumpings that were, mm. were like uh, some of these dudes from these other gangs caught a few of their homies in. Because in Juvenile Hall, it was kind of on site. Unlike yes. the county jail where we all got to get along, Juvenile Hall, you're still getting at it with your enemies. Yes. And, and there was a few people from each hood back then. So Yeah, it's how it, it's how it yeah. was, right? Yeah. And the staff, how was, did you see like any? I was just talking with this, my homeboy Lonely about this. The staff in our day in the Juvenile Hall, unlike what's going on I'm hearing about today, is it, they were cool. They would bring treats. They would bring movies. The staff, they had free staff, like people that just got the job. Mm -hmm. And they were there like to just babysit kids. Mm -hmm. So it, in my experience, staff was cool. 
Oh yeah, my experience with staff was always yeah. kind of okay. That's yeah, cool. I mean, there was yeah. always there's always one or two that are like, you know, a little extra or whatever. Yeah, but, but for the most part, smooth experience with that. Yeah. You were just having fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it sounds selfish, but I mean, it, no, to no, me, no, that was it's, having fun. No, it's not. It doesn't sound selfish because I understand it. Yeah. Maybe other people that are watching, it's like, oh my well, god. Well, to I, a lot of other people, I've heard them talk about that, and it was tragic. Oh my god, my jail. Like, but for me, it was like. It sounds bad, but like I was having fun. Yeah, and that's why I like to have different people because yeah. I like to. We want to hear different stories. Yeah. Like it's not tragic for everybody. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Obviously, some yeah. have it worse than others. Yeah. You know, what? every place that you are at. Yeah. So you enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. At least you enjoyed it while you were there, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you're an adult now. I'm an adult now. Uh, I have some some sports scholarships that I'm on the cusp of losing because my behavior is getting worse and worse. In this transition to becoming an adult, our tagging crew has gotten a little more severe. A couple of our friends have made some choices that have put us in a position where in the 90s, if anybody knows the street culture of the graffiti and the gangs, and like I want to say 92, 93, there was something that came from the jail systems that let all of us know that there's no more graffiti crews. You will, you guys are acting like gangs. Okay. You either join gangs or become your own gang if, you're, if your numbers are good enough and you have the permission from important people you either so you either clicked up or became your own neighborhood. Now a lot of the LA tagging crews were big enough that they could stand on their own, and become their own neighborhoods, which also greatly increased all the numbers for the county jail systems. Increased uh, the homies in jail. Their g crews were big enough that now all these new gangs pop up all over LA. In the valley, we were small. Mm. All of our crews, we maybe thirty. I thought 30. they were like tag bangers or something. Well, yeah, but that it like evolved from graffiti to tag bangers, oh. which is why the the edicts came out from the jail system. If you know the history, like. Okay, it's time. You want to act like big big dogs? Next step, you're joining gangs, or if you hit the county jail system as a tagger, you're, it's on site. Oh. So we were, mind you, my tagging crew is comprised of like 15, 20 white boys, a couple Mexicans, and a black guy. And we're like, oh shit, what do we do? <gasps> yeah, you guys were like, oh. I look, do you, were you ever a little like intimidated or like a little afraid of like what if? Well, my, my problem, and I, I've said this a few times lately, and it, it pisses off some people, but I don't really care because it's my truth. I was more into graffiti. I didn't want to make the jump to a gang. At the same time, you're 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 uh, you're stuck with all of this peer pressure of damn, but I don't want to be a bitch. But yeah. in my mind, I'm like, this is not a good decision. Like you knew. I knew it wasn't a good decision because I know that a lot of shit changes when you join a gang. This isn't like we didn't grow up in East LA. We didn't grow up in the projects. This is not really our lifestyle, yet we're about to make a decision that changes our lives in the valley. And our, we lost a few members to the jail system with some pretty serious charges. So a few of us were left to make this decision. And we made a decision to join a gang in the city of Sun Valley, where I had already moved to. And immediately joining, my, uh, I could say my neighborhood. I was from the Sun Valley Diablos. All of us, my crew became a clique. They jumped all of us in. We become a clique from this neighborhood. Now, mind you, this neighborhood in the 90s, we didn't really know what we were getting into. No. This neighborhood already is under a green light. They're already in trouble. We didn't know this. Oh. And we joined all of us. Because you guys actively, are so naive. Yeah, actively joining this gang. We're like, okay, cool. It's easy. It's a smaller neighborhood. They're not really that established. They're, they weren't really Southsiders yet. They were still just a gang and under a green light. But we didn't realize how serious that was either. Yeah. So we made a different decision. Now, mind you, we're jumped into this gang and we're being attacked from every angle. In the valley where my neighborhood was, it was on Laurel Canyon, almost North Hollywood, but not yet Pacoima either. Okay. So we have Pacoima on one side, which is like 30 or 40 clicks. Pacoima is probably one of the biggest cities in our valley. It has monstrous amounts of gangs. Each gang, each click in Pacoima has got hundreds of members. To get home through Laurel Canyon, we got to fight our way through 20 clicks just on the boulevard. If we pass our neighborhood, we got like four or five other neighborhoods that are very ingrained in established for years the north hollywood boys the locals the violent boys so all of these different gangs are like yeah. on you they're Not on you us. but on well, you they're on the violent boys was under the green light with us so was a, another neighborhood called radford street we were all under this and this is like early 90s early 90s yeah this is early 90s when all this is going on so now we're not only from a gang which is having to learn how to be a, a gang, gang member, member. D the dress code changes you know you're 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 showing up on the block in the 90s if you remember 
It's not like today. Our culture as gang members in the Valley or LA was different. You're on the block. You're wearing an attire. You're posted up. You're taking shifts. You're selling dope in the hood. You're on the rooftops. We're, we're watching our back. Like yes. the culture for us in the Valley, I tell these kids today that drop, I made this joke on the, on the Cholo podcast where I'm like, you know, the, the skinny jeans and the Crocs is cool. But in our day, we knew who, we knew who we were looking for because we all had a uniform yes. and you knew what we, we were doing, where we were. Our hair was different. Everything was a specifically group network. So, and we're learning how to do all this. And then, and then we're realizing, wow, but we got a green light too. What the fuck? We go to county jail, things change. <gasps> Mind you, we're going, all of us are getting arrested in and out randomly for, because also the cops were different in the nineties. This was the era of the crash unit. Yes. Whether you're from LA or the Valley, crash unit was everywhere and they were not playing. Yes. They will beat your ass and drop us off in our enemy's yes. hood just to prove a point. Yes. And things were serious. So we're worrying about cops, enemies. It was a huge, it was a huge thing in the in the in the nineties. Yes. And it kept you on your fucking toes, toes, man. It kept you on your toes. For sure. So when did you hit the county for the first time? Were you still a green uh, I light? Say, yeah. I want to say I was 18. Okay. And I was uh I got arrested for possession. Now back this is funny too, because back in the nineties, you get arrested for dope, you get arrested for a nickel of weed. And it's, it's a felony. Yes. You're going to county for six months. <laughs> That's when they yeah. were overcrowding the county, you know, seven people to a two bedroom room. And 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 uh I hit the county as a white boy. How did wait? So you hit oh, the county. Wait, so yeah. you hit the county as a white boy. Being arrested in, for crack cocaine. For, I got arrested for possession of crack cocaine. You're from this gang also that yeah. has like the green light. Yeah. You know, you didn't even know what you were getting yourself into. And now I didn't understand the yeah. enormous how, how thing that this is. Yeah. Yes. So then you're just getting in the county. How did that go for you? Well, surprisingly enough, it went a lot easier than I thought. Oh, I, and I, you liked it. Well, because no, I did not like it. <laughs> And this is where I want to share. I'll be able to share some emotions and some feelings. Yes, you want if that. You're gonna, if you're going to go against what I'm saying, I'll, I'll stand here as Mohawk man, call you a liar. Because you hit the county jail as an 18-year-old kid. Let me tell you something. It's a fucking experience. When you're going up these escalators after you're through processing 200 people to a cell, taking shits and having to use the facilities in front of other grown men sharing toilet paper. When you're nuts to butt, sometimes you're crowded up against each other while someone's taking a dump and you're sitting right next to the toilet. I rem if you remember the county jails in these times, they overcrowded like a motherfucker. People were sleeping on the floor. There's no room for nothing. Uh, and when you're processed- and you're and 18. Process yeah, I'm pro and I'm a kid. And mind you, and I'm a white kid from a gang that doesn't hasn't even learned all these rules yet. And I hit the through. Pro I made it through processing by being quiet, and and uh, nobody's really hitting me up because you couldn't really at that time tell. I had I had lost my little skater gothic tagger look. I had adopted the our 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 uniform. I'm in there with Dickies, and I think I had some Cortez and a, a Ben Davis. I remember it was a light blue Ben Davis shirt. Oh, you're looking sharp. Yeah, I was looking sharp, and I got blue eyes. <laughs> I got blue eyes and, 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 and no, yeah, yes, and nobody could tell. They couldn't really tell. Are you is he a white boy or is he a homie? Yeah. But in the but in the nineties, also if you grew up in the valley. That was our look. Most of the white boys had adopted that look anyway because it was our culture. Mm. And our cultures were blended. Mm -hmm. So I, I hit through processing easy. I'm up the escalators. And if you remember the L.A. County Jail in the 90s, you'll remember for men, 9500 was a Thunderdome on that top floor. When you're up those escalators to the top, you pass the John Wayne mural. And you go, you're ushered in by like four cops are escorting 50, 60 people with bedrolls. Oh. And you hit that dorm. I can close my eyes and see, you can see the payphones on the left, the bunks to the right, the showers in the back, the, 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 the gunner towers with the glass to the right over there. And you walk in this dorm and there's a thousand or more people. Guys. I was fucking overwhelmed. Cause you can hear, all of a sudden your hearing clicks in, you can hear screams. You can hear people getting beat up. And if you look, you're you can kidding. see the fights going on at that moment through the through the bunk bed aisles. And you're walking. At the same time, you can smell those shitty ass bars of dial soap that they would hand out, those little thin ones. And I can smell that through the shower steam that's going while people are showering, people are getting beat up. People are on the phones arguing with babies. Mom is calling their mom. Mom, please, I need money. Mom, can you get me an attorney? I need bail. Uh, don't leave me. I love you. All these emotions. Uh, your senses are overloaded because there's a hundred things going on. And the worst thing I'm thinking is, there's like four dudes getting stomped out. Nobody's doing nothing. Everybody's minding their business. And that's when you realize this is serious. Yes. County jail was serious. You could die. You could get raped. You could get beat up. And I'm a white boy. And I look around. I could see maybe four or four of us. Oh. Four of us. Maybe six out of a thousand. A lot of homies. Uh, probably 60 blacks. Blacks. You know, and then when you're ushered in with your bedrolls, like they're representatives of each group, they will approach you. 
and the blacks avoided us and because there was a lot of me and some homies. I think there was one black and a lot of, there was like maybe a, a few homies and, and a, a couple white boys. And I remember specifically, I was overwhelmed. And this white boy from San Gabriel Valley from SGV, his name was Warrior, long hair, looked like a biker, real good looking dude, walks up, what's up, homie? Uh, what's your, what race are you? And I'm like, I'm white. Get the fuck over here. Grab your shit. Come with me. So I didn't have a chance to even say, wait a minute, I'm from a neighborhood. Oh, my goodness. But I, I just went. My race was my race. Because that's and, how it goes. And you kind well, of that's mean? how it goes. And in all honesty, I'm a white boy. Yes, I'm from Diablos. I love my hood. I got my hood blasted across my stomach. We'll never leave. I will always represent my hood. But to me, right. my race is white. I'm white. Yeah. And I made that decision. I followed that dude. And that's where it went. It wasn't like... I specifically plotted or planned to go that way. He asked me a question. I answered the question. I am a white boy. I went where I belong. Yes. Never did I deny my hood. Never will I deny my hood. Yes. I am a white boy. And again, we weren't that really affiliate. We were fighting a green light. So for me, it alleviated all those problems. Did, I didn't have to get. Did the, it really? It did. I never had okay. the problem in the county jail. I'm uh -huh. a white boy. I'm a wood. Now I'm a wood. Okay. And I'm in that car. And, and, but, but I'm also from my gang. Now, mind you, I'm never, I don't get hit up because I'm white. I'm not getting hit up all the time. Ah. So it's just, it is what it is. And uh, that's what happened. And I stayed there and uh, it progressed. Uh, I eventually got released. And um, so how long were you there this fuck, first like time? like three weeks. I had to wait for bail. I got bailed out. My fuck, mom like three weeks. And it sounded, <laughs> you just said, just right now, your little, this little story you just said sounded like you were there for so no, well, that, long. It seemed like it. Three weeks in the county jail. If you've been there back then, that three weeks probably seemed like eight months. No, I know, it's I know what you mean, but it's everything just like you go through, how yeah. you expressed everything and how you were just so, you know, like, em like your emotions about it. It was just, it's just like. Well, I can still. I, I'm not even lying to you. No, if I, I say I, when you. I close my eyes, I can still smell that dial. So ah, I can remember the phone call voices vividly. That is. These crazy. are things when you go through, you don't ever forget. No, yeah, yeah. yeah and so just, your mom bailed you out. Eventually, yeah, mom bailed me out for a drug possession charge, and then I, my dumbass went right back to the hood, and now I'm again, I'm coming home, chin's a little higher. I've been to the county jail. I'm in the hood. I check in. What you know what I mean? Like, it's how you the, do what you're supposed to do? Yeah, I'm I'm back in the hood. I'm a white boy, but you know, I tell a few people they don't really give a shit. Mind you, my homies are actively fighting the green light. It took us a couple years to get the green light off. So, so yeah, I'm back in the hood and I'm now I'm doing stuff and I'm way more active in that lifestyle and uh, selling drugs, doing all of that. And uh, the gang life was hard. There was a lot of, we went through a lot of, a lot of stuff that. Uh, you seem in, overwhelmed just even. Well, cause when we talk, it, it brings up stuff and it makes me remember things you went through shootings or people getting hurt and you know, yeah. and uh, those just, times were serious. They're, they were yeah. serious for people. They're not, they're not, they're not a joke. And you know, no, people die, people all. get hurt. You, you lose friends and yes. it's like going to war. Yeah. It's almost like joining the military. You go to war with these guys. And I, you know, I'm always reminded of new emotions and new memories whenever I, I talk. Hey, I just, you're able to feel those emotions and you're not like, cold. I, well, yeah, it's over, they're overwhelming sometimes the feeling. I remember my, my homeboy getting shot, just sitting on a pay and the bullet going through his butt cheeks. And he's, he's so scared, uh, but he's he... also like, and he's laughing because he's like, damn, they he's shot like, my, my ass. ass yeah. You know, like it's funny. It's, some of these things are funny. There's a lot of memories, a lot of good times and bad times in the hood. Obviously. There's a lot sure. that I don't want to forget. Yeah, it's not, and it, yeah. you know what? There, um, we don't need to forget where we came from. Like, yeah. why would we want to forget where we came from? That's what made us. I mean, it doesn't define who we yeah. are, but it's definitely a big part of who we are. Yeah. And there's no need for us to forget. It's, I love it. Yeah. I love where I come from. I love yeah. how I grew up. I yeah. love my, my past. And yeah. like, you know, it's not that we're glorifying yeah. it. Like. But it's how it's, it's it's most of them are my growing up friends from elementary. Yeah. So yeah. like, why would I let go of my friends? Yeah. You know, we've been yeah. through some shit, but it, yeah. If we grow up, we all get married. We have life. You know, we have family. Still, and life it, changes. Life changes, and yeah. you're supposed to change it. Yeah. Like we're not supposed to stay the same it's way. It's funny you're saying that because lately I've been able with social media stuff to reconnect with some of my older homeboys that I had lost throughout the years, and we were saying the same things. Like, man, we're old now. Yeah. Remember, and we sit there on the phone and talk about those times, but. We're able to talk about it and just realize, damn, we were, we're here. We're we made blessed. It. We're blessed because we made it. Yes. Some of the shit that we did and went through, it's, I'm amazed I'm not in jail for life or dead. Yes. You know? Like, serious, yeah. No, I believe you. Yeah. And, you know, and like, a lot of times, like, you know, we, you know, the people that are in and out don't appreciate it. But a lot of yeah. times, like, like, I don't even, I genuinely, okay, I'm not going to say I genuinely don't feel bad, but I don't feel bad for the people that are in and out, in and out, in and out. Yeah, because they're making choices. Because, exactly. Like, they're I do feel you. bad for the ones that went in when they were so young and they, 
I haven't been out and they're yeah. not going to be out. Like I genuinely yeah. feel for them. And I understand the lifestyle yeah. that they're living in there because and a lot of those people though went to jail under all those over sentencing laws where yes. they didn't need to be there that long, yes. but they fucked them over. Yes. Yes. They did crime, but they overdid it with yes. the sentencing and now they're stuck in a system. They can't get and out. And it of. sucks. And then know? like those people you're talking about, like I got homies who are drug addicts and every other week it's like, Doug, get your shit together, bro. And it's, you're a 50 year old man fucking stealing and slamming drugs. Stop. Your yeah. kids are growing up. Yeah. All of us have quit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so. love, like we just got to love ourselves. Yeah. Love ourselves. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. Well, let's go back. Let's, let's, let's go, go back. back. So you're out of the county. You thought yeah. you were cool. You're, you know, I mean, you were cool. Right? Yeah. You, you were cool. fucking yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I was cool. <laughs> um, tell Don't us. want you to know I was terrified in the county <laughs> jail. I won't come home and tell that story. But, you know. No, you literally just said you were terrified. Yeah, I mean, those emotions were real that you go yes. through when you're first time and you're a kid hitting those areas. Yeah. So no. you're out. Tell us about your uh, your second encounter, like that took you to prison. Well, I mean, I got we got back into gangbanging pretty hard. Like I said, the, the lifestyle in the middle of a green light, the life was hard. Like I said, we was a couple summers. We had so much shootings, and like, I mean, I don't like telling too many details, but like we had a lot of shootings. We had to go through getting around town, and sometimes there were six or seven shootings a day. And, and oh my god, and I, we would just be exhausted. With yeah. guns and gunpowder, cars smelling. If you've ever been in shootings, drive-bys or regular shootings, the smell of that gunpowder in your car is burned into your nose. You can never. Mm. I remember one time we put a black light in the car and the gunpowder. We were driving old school 86 Regals and Cutlasses, yes. with European Fernandes and Monte Carlo Super Sports and Luxury Sports. And those cars always had the felt rooftops and the felt seats. And mm. I remember one of these days uh, we had been actively involved in a few things and my homeboy brought in a black light just to look in the car. Cause we always, you know, the cops, that's how they catch you. We, we were getting wise to how they would catch you. So we put a black light in our car and the whole car was burnt orange. And we're like, what the fuck? And we remember seeing and hearing, this is how you, this is how cops will catch you. Uh -huh. Gunpowder residue on your fingers, fucking our cars. We had done so many, cause back that was the drive-by era before there was much yes. to do with that. So like yes. everybody doing drive-bys. Our cars were full of, we were finding shell casings and we're like, damn, we're, we're driving around and murder case traps. If we ever get pulled over, we're fucked. All Dummies. the evidence is right here. Dummies. <laughs> and we started ripping apart the interior, felt interiors of our cars to change it out. And yes. And uh, anyway, yeah, we had a lot of stuff like that. A lot of shootings that were just amazing. I remember bullets going through our, our pants and it was just intense. I the get 90s it. era was, man, it was like a, it's like a, it's like a Super Bowl sporting event no i i, I yeah you know you made it through those eras you're just like man i'm 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 happy to be where i'm at right now yes definitely yeah. we're blessed but tell us about your first time that what led you to go to prison like the you my know? first time going to prison um i think i got in an argument and threatened someone and then there was like an assault i think oh. that was the first time it was something stupid Super small i did 19 years 19 and a half total Three different terms. One was like three years and eight months, and another three years and eight or six months. Going and they were off for like little dumb things? No, they were felonies, but they were just, you know, back then they would just shoot you to, to prison for a couple of years. You'd get a turnaround and come home. Okay. Three years and eight months is kind of like a turnaround in the state system. No, for sure. Because it takes you, you're in the county for a year fighting that. Then you hit the, the reception for a few months. By the time you get upstate, you'll do eight months and, and then, then come, come back. home. Yeah. yeah, I barely get a TV and you're coming home. Yeah. So, and then my, but my last one, my last prison term was 12 years and six months. I got sentenced to nine and I got really actively involved at that point. Well, tell us uh, what your case was for and like, you know. My case was, I was, uh, I had evolved from gangs to doing drugs. Now, when you're selling drugs and gang banging, then you start, I didn't start doing drugs till way after I was 21. I was sober. Oh. Because remember, I was playing sports. I yeah. had an opportunity to maybe play professional baseball and I blew it. I chose to smoke crack with my homeboy Chubbs. Crack being the first thing I ever tried before cigarettes, alcohol, or a joint. Oh, you were hooked. Bad decision. I was barefoot trading everything I owned within one year. <gasps> Career excellent. All-star gangbanger, oh. all-star drug dealer to just fucking trash. Got myself back out. It took me a while to get back out of that, but to get off a of crack, my one uh, I hooked up with, a, with one of my white friends, and he convinced me to try crystal meth. Worse. I started slamming crystal meth. <gasps> But the good thing about crystal meth, not that there's much good, but I'll say it gave me about a year of normal behavior, not barefoot selling everything. Like crack cocaine takes you to the bottom real quick. No, I know. I smoked crack too. Yeah, horrible. In the 80s, 90s crack, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. We're talking crack. 
I mean, I didn't smoke crack straight, but I mean, I did smoke a gang of primos. Like, dogs, yeah. like 20 to 30 oh, a you're night. Cheating. Like, you're come cheating, on, 20 to 30 primos a you're night? Cheating. That shit didn't even burn. Yeah, you're cheating. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, I tried that a few times, but after I had already smoked crack, but I was like, nah, just give me the crack once at that point. But yeah, the meth let me let me act a little normal for a while, but it made my behavior more erratic. Like more crazier, yes. Yeah, crazy. Like I'm not paranoid of you. I'm not scared of you. Like crack made me scared of my own shadow. Meth made me paranoid to where I'm sharpening a knife, getting ready for you. Oh. Or I'm loading my gun, keeping it right here at all times because I think you're plotting on me. It's, there are different variations of paranoia. Yes. So at the end of the day, they're both bad. No, for sure. But I was able to maintain some sort of a lifestyle and not trade everything on meth. On meth, I'm accumulating a bunch of useless shit. Yeah, I got a room full of crap I don't need. I got I 17 need. boxes of paint. I'm never going to paint nothing, but I got it just in case. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, you're dumb. Uh, that was good. Yeah. I literally there are seven cars being worked on. None of them are ever going to get finished, <laughs> but they're there just in case. You're dumb. That yeah. was so funny because I literally pictured myself Going through boxes when I was on meth, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Collecting all the Sharpie markers from Walmart. Going to Walmart on the craft aisle for seven hours. Taking up oh, hostage, the whole aisle. Collecting paint by numbers. Like, I'm never going to paint by number. <laughs> Fucking stupid, but... Yeah. You're dumb. That was yeah. so well, good. Well, I was selling drugs, and I decided one day after getting home from that second prison term, my three years and eight months, my second term, I was home for 98 days. On the 98th day, I had already been selling drugs. I had a little homie who was hanging out with me in the trap scene. One of my good friends, you know, I had this girl that would hang out with me. We would hook up and she'd help me sell dope. And, and you were still slamming though? Yeah. Okay. I'm slamming meth. But I decided, hey, I want to get clean. This is too much. And I did it one of the first times I tried doing it on my own. And uh, of course, she's upset now because now she's like, oh, well, my connection now. How am I going to get high? I have sex with him and I, he gives me free dope and, and he takes care of everything. Fuck, what the fuck? So I gave her like all my dope. I gave her an ounce and I said, here, I'm going to get clean. I'm going to drop you off at your friend's house. Here's a hundred bucks for food. Leave me alone for like a week. I'm going to sleep. I, I got to get out of this because I'm never going to stop getting yes. in trouble. It's one of those moments where I, I, knew, just you. I knew worse things were coming. So I drop her off, give her all the dope. Within three hours, all I told her was this, don't call me. Whatever you're going to do, I don't give a shit. Here's an ounce of speed, needles, food money. Please, please let me sleep. I hadn't slept in like two weeks. So I needed rest. You know, and you're not sleeping yes. on meth. You're hallucinating. Oh, you're seeing you're extra. Yeah, how I even drove this vehicle two blocks to drop her off was behind me. And lo and behold, three hours later. She's calling you. Back to back to back. Mind you, I had a flip phone. Remember the flip phone? There yes. was no iPhone. I had a flip, a, a, a razor, a razor flip phone. It was a bomb phone too, by the way. No, it was. Those yeah. were the ones I took my first pictures yeah, of. Yeah, a little selfie, ugly <laughs> selfie. Yeah. yeah, so she called me. She was calling for like an hour straight. And I finally said, Johanna, what? What, please don't do this to me. And she's like, the dope's gone and I'm hungry. She, she took all the dope from me and I'm like, that's not my problem. And I hung the phone. She called for three more hours straight and I lost my shit. I said, listen, I told you, please. Like we got to do an argument, but mind you, this was my homie. And I go, to, she's like, please at least pick me up and drop me somewhere else because I don't want to be here. I understand you're trying to get clean, but just get me out of here. She took all the dope. Her and these tweakers took all the dope. I don't have it. I don't she's have it. Some of these She's lying. Guys. They did all the dope. They did all the dope. They spent the money probably on more dope. And now they just wanted. And I w I'm like, fuck. I got mad. I said, if I come down there, I'm fucking everybody up. I'm fucking everybody up. And you're this up. big dude. Because you're a big I man. I was bigger back then. I was way bigger back then, too. I said, I'm, it's bad. So are you sure you want me to come down there? And she said, uh, yeah. All right. I had a brand new Cadillac Eldorado on my 20s and system. And I smashed down there. And I get there and I had an eight pound sledgehammer and something had snapped in my brain. And I remember walking into this trashy ass trailer park in White Boy, Santa Clarita. I pull up in there, I knock on the back door. The, the, and I, I remember specifically <coughs> the neighbor comes out onto his porch and he's staring at me. He knows. I pulled up bumping, you know, in a yeah. trailer park, bumping. <laughs> everyone's like, oh shit. This trailer has already been on the watch for the community for being bad stuff. I knock on the back door. Johanna comes to the door. I grabbed her by the hair. I didn't know this guy behind me had cameras on his property and he was filming me. I grabbed her by the hair and I just pushed her down two steps. In the state of California, if you hold someone or move them five feet out or something like, I forget what the parameters are, that's kidnapping. And she's, she says, ow, my hair. So this guy assumes she's being kidnapped. He calls the cops. 911 call, goes out right there. I let her go, I said, get in the car, let's get out of here. He didn't know that we're really friends. And she goes, all right, all right, I'll get in the car. You know what I mean? Like he misses the oh. part where she's like, yeah, she, he didn't know. 
I go in, I kick the door open with the sledgehammer and I go in this trailer that's a trap house and I said, you're going to take my friend's dope? I said, fuck that bitch. You know, they're arguing. I fucking took the eight. I popped the refrigerator, the sinks, the toilets, everything that was surrounded. You're just like this. I went around everything. just fucking losing my shit. Especially, I don't know what you're saying. I know what well, I was in rage on I know dope too. Feeling. Yeah. I know that feeling. Yeah. I know exactly that feeling. I could, you know what's crazy? I could like feel it. Like you're just like. <sighs> yeah, I was just at my wit's end. I wanted to get sober. They're, they're bugging me. Nobody, the universe won't leave me alone. It's like this had to happen. Yes. I smash everything that was ceramic or not bolted down in this double wide trailer with a sledgehammer. I'm exhausted by the time I'm done breaking up this people's house. They have all secluded themselves in a back bedroom, locked the doors. They've called the cops also. Dang. And when I, when I heard them on the phone, the cops, I came to and I said, shit, I got about like two and a half minutes to get the fuck out of here. And I heard her snitching on me saying, his nickname is Mohawk Matt. He's from Diablos. He's white. He's fucking connected in prison with the white group, but he's from a gang. I heard her giving the oh, cops. Oh, she gave him everything. She gave him everything. And I'm like, fuck. Like, even I though got, you went to go save the bitch. I, it doesn't matter now. And I, I get outside with the sledgehammer. As soon as I come out, the guy is standing on the porch and he says, I've got it all on camera. The cops are on the way. And I'm like, fuck. I look at Johanna and I'm like, damn. I said, get in the car. And I get in the car. I throw the sledgehammer. We take off. I Cops hit the block. I take them on a high speed chase to Palmdale, Lancaster. Halfway there, I stop. They stop at a safe distance behind me. And I'm like, get out of the car. Just get out. You're just, you're safe. They're, they're going to fuck with me. Just tell them. She goes, Donna, fuck that. I got your back. Let's go. And I'm like, dog, I love you, but just come on. Get she out. goes, I promise you I'll get on. I'll get up. I got your back in court. And I said, are you sure? She goes, trust me. I'll stay with the cops. I got your back. This fucking bitch went on the stand and said, I fucking love that dude. He didn't kidnap me. We were art. like, she had my back. I have never seen a homie get someone's back. This bitch took the stand and said, he didn't kidnap me. Fuck you. We were in an argument. That's my dog. He was protecting me. They were abusing me in that trailer. So in the court, as I, after I got arrested, the, they dropped the kidnapping charges. They fucking, they only ran me with two counts of felon, criminal threats. They dropped home invasion because it couldn't sit but what they got me with was two counts of criminal threats, felony vandalism in a home or something like that. And they gave me nine years and I Dang, turned Dang, yeah. that is whack. Yeah, but that, but. But before it was different. Before different. And I ended up doing 12 years and six months on that. Wow. So yeah. you got sentenced to 12 years. Were you fighting this case? I fought in, it in county for 18 months. And we, I was about to ask dude. you that. And if how you've ever been in the county that long, you die a little bit every day. I don't care how much store you have. My mom was sending me books. I had 150 store and two packages a week. I'm done. You die. There's no way to live in the county jail sucks. It so, sucks the life out of you. So tell us. Why tell us a little bit more about the county jail for you, especially for you? Uh, you know, you're white. Like I always just hear stories of it, it homies. Was, <laughs> well, I mean, it was it was cool. We, it was cool. It was it was easy for me. Okay. They were rotating all of us through the main lines throughout the, the to the twin towers back. They were filling up the whites in the towers, then back to the, oh. they were constantly switching everyone around from 33, 3500. High power overflows were being all moved around constantly. The floors were changing. The cops were very deadly back then. You had to really watch about the cops. Tell us. Well, the, the cops had their own little groups and they, they will fuck you up in a heartbeat. I got in a few fights with them because I have a fuck the sheriff's tattoo. I got uh, in a few fights with them. But again, just like, like they never, I never snitched on them. And every time we get interviewed, nah, they didn't do shit. You know, you get a few extra lunches for keeping your mouth shut and then okay. back to normal program. Um, I, I, I had good, I had, I had some good friends. I made some good friends, but I read a lot in the county jail and kind of kept to myself because I, I, I was hoping to, I had an attorney. I was hoping to beat the case, but I didn't. You didn't. I get to uh, get sentenced and back to prison. What would you say was the craziest thing you saw in those 18 months? Um, that you could say. Or I've that seen, I, well, I mean, I've seen, I was there watching the cops like harass, harass That is people. That is they, crazy. They were, uh, they were really they were really bad on a lot of the harassment. They would take dudes' stores and they'd search the dorms. One of the worst things I've seen, I mean, th there's always physical stuff. It doesn't mean, I don't, I'm not just saying physical. I don't mean like worse by well, that. The worst I thing mean, I would see is whenever they'd search our dorms, they'd take our store. Yeah, that's They'd smash all the homies and all the whites for some reason. They would always smash our bags in store. We'd get back to our cells. They'd remove us to the yards. That the is the worst. We'd come back to our, our cells. All of our canteen, that our family. Now, now mind you, this is from our family. We're not buying this. Yes. Our families, our babies, mamas. 
And like we get back to our roots. That, to this give is you property money. we're allowed to have by the Title 15 law, and there's we get back and it's been stepped on. Smashed. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, dude. And we were we were having to file grievances and nothing's being heard in there. But fuck, our family's just wasting money. Yeah. You know, and that we'd come back and our family pictures have been ripped. <gasps> and yeah, they, the cops were oh, bad back yeah, then. Yeah, that Those is terrible. Those sheriffs were foul back then. That is foul. That is yeah. freaking the worst. Yeah. That is super, because they're definitely breaking you down. Well, they were, yeah, that was their whole agenda, to break us down. And they, and they were quick to abuse you, too, because you, what are we going to do? Go out with the yeah, yeah, we can fight cops, but there's no winning. You're not going to yeah, win yeah, fighting yeah. a cop. And it was just a really dangerous time with the cops back then. I've heard it's all been changed now, the investigation process. They're on them. Oh, which is good. Yeah. Definitely good, I mean, you know? Guess, because yeah. they need protection. Just because they're in there doesn't mean, like, no. Like, every, they're all human. Like, yeah. you know, everybody yeah. has their human rights, no matter yeah. what. Like, yeah. Okay, so you get sentenced to 18, I mean 18 years, uh, nine, nine years. Nine years, and I did 12 and six months. Um, where did you end up going? It was I went upstate, I went to Delano. Okay. Delano, got, caught the chain in uh, Kern Valley. I mean, I got bounced around a lot. How I got was, kind of involved in the white stuff in jail. And uh, Did you have like a choice, you know, like, you know, for example, you know, like us, like, I, don't, I mean us, like as in Latinos or whatever. Mm. Um, did you... Um, you know, sometimes like how they say, like, they don't have a choice if you have to, if they ask you to do something. Was it the same way for you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah I had to, uh, I got involved. I got involved the best I could. Oh, so you were super well, involved. I didn't think I was going to come home. So I went in there with the horrible attitude that. Tell you know us what? about that. I went in there. I got the attitude, the fuck you attitude. Like, I'm going to blame you. I had a 666 blasted on my throat. I had a bunch of tattoos all over that I've removed. I, I'm sure I had a lot of hateful tattoos. Oh. And I got involved political tattoos and stuff when you're in jail that are important to us that I've removed because it just doesn't apply to the outside world for me. And I don't really and care. And thank God you made it out. Well, yeah, and I, and I couldn't be doing anything I'm doing now if I didn't go through the therapy and the change process, get sober and and remove some of these images. And um, I had, like I said, I had the attitude where it's your fault. It's everybody's fault for what I did. Not realizing that I was on drugs and I smashed up a trailer and I scared a family. Even though the family were dirtbag tweakers, I still, I still did this and I had to come to terms with it's not nobody's fault but mine. I did that. But you know what's funny that you say that because you say um, you had the you went in there with the the f attitude. Fuck like, it. Well, I was, you, my plan was to never come home. I was like, I'm going. I'm getting as involved as I can, and I'm going to okay. make that name for myself. And I don't want to. I'm just going to be that guy. Okay, even though you were only sentenced to nine yeah, years. Yeah, but nine years to me was, was that, your whole life. Was yeah. At that back then, it was like, wow, that's I'm dead. I'm never coming home. Oh, you okay. know, you go through all these thoughts. My mom will die. I'll lose my mom. Lose my best friend. Uh, I ha had a son. I wasn't in good standing with because of my lifestyle. I'm like, I'm never going to see him again anyway. His baby's mom already don't like me. Um, everybody's going to start to die off. Mind you, you're right. Nine years really isn't that long. No, now. Nowadays, yeah. It isn't. But back then, to me, that was an eternity. And I was like, yeah. fuck it. Let's just go. Well, what can I do? Raise my hand. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. So the, so the being a white in the inmate system, also, then you, the next step is to get involved in their groups. Okay. And stuff like that. And yeah. that's progressed throughout that. Oh. Yeah. So within those nine years, what was the worst thing you did that you could speak on? Well, I got involved in a group. Uh, I'm just going to leave it with that. I okay. got involved in a group. And I, I remember I could tell this story. Um, it's really powerful. And I remember the speech one of my brothers told me in regards to recruitment. And I'm just going to leave it very yes. vague. I was sitting in a yard, I think I was, I forget what, were we in Lancaster or might have been in Kern Valley. No, I think we were in Lancaster. Oh no, Calipatria. I think I was in Calipatria. And I remember my brother, one of my brother's pirate, one of my SAV homeboys, he was telling me there was three of us new guys just hit, you know, from reception to the joint. There's all these changes you go through from the county jail. Changes within There's, yourself? No. Or changes within the county the jail politics and workings work one way in the county jail. When you get to reception, it's a different jump. Okay. Things change a little it's bit. It's like you go to a different job, you learn different things. Yes, but your rules, your lifestyles all change and what you do and what you can't do also in each location. Sometimes each prison has different ways of getting down as well. And then from reception, when I got to my first joint in Calipat, we were like, uh, you know, you're new on the yard. I'm getting my laundry. I'm waiting by canteen to get my laundry. And uh, my homeboy pirate, there's three of us. Three. Of, I forget there was me. I'm SFV, so I'm already his homeboy because we're from the same area. Mm -hmm. You have your cars. And there's a couple dudes from IE, and there was someone else, I think, from Dago down south, and maybe another white boy from, like, Stockton or, or, or uh, Tulare County or something. And we're all whites. 
and my homeboy pirate, it's, it's real powerful. It's almost like I could cry because it was that serious of a moment. Um, he approached us like a, like a great white shark, like a predator. He's already all tipped up and connected. I'll never forget him walking up with these. If you've been to the joint, you remember all the homies, the homies and the whites had these glasses that were called transitionals. They looked super sharp. I didn't even wear glasses, but I wanted them just to look like these dudes. All the older homies had them and they would change black in the sun. And then when they're in the dorm, they're fucking just regular glasses. And all these dudes walks up with, with just that, that walk. He just That's had that smooth. walk smooth with some Air Force Ones and his tailor-made fucking CDC prison pants and his shirt was all cuffed and freshly pressed and fucking, you know, sewn. Mm -hmm. And he's like, what's up, homeboy? Where are you from? I'll never forget it. And I said, I'm from SFV. He goes, that's right. You're my homeboy. You're hometown. He goes, sit over here next to me. And I said, who are you? And he goes, I'm fucking pirate from SFV. And I, I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, well, it's a pleasure to meet you, brother. And he goes, that's right, dog. And he looks at these two other dudes. He said, what's up with you guys? Where are you from? And, I, and like, they mumble. They don't have, they're not speaking the right way. They're just, like they're, you know, like there's a way you're, well, because he's sizing you up. This motherfucker is a predator and he's sizing you up for your next leap in your, in your, in your, in your, in your system. You know, some people can transition into prison gangs and groups. Some people can't. It's not some people everybody. can cut it and some can't. Yeah. You either, you either get it and you get it right then and there on the spot or you're not. And you'll end up getting whacked or killed if you try to force yourself into something you're not made yeah. for. And these two other kids, I think the ones from the IE were just like, now, this is nothing against the IE. I got a gang of good, solid homeboys from the IE. But these two kids just didn't have it. Yeah, well, I mean, they it's, just not, weren't, it's not for it everybody. And they just, oh, I'm the, 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 you know, and then and the dudes up north even had it. And mind you, the northern southern thing's another issue, too. But, yeah, but that's but neither the, here But, but he was talking, and they were like, yeah, what's up? And so he goes, he goes, hey, let me, let me talk to you guys for a second. He goes, he goes, I'll never forget. He said, we got, we got, we got, a, there's two buses in the prison system. He said, this bus right here, and he looks at us and he says, this is how serious your next answers are going to be. Not knowing you're in a recruitment process, you don't even fucking realize what you're involved in right here. And um, he says, this bus right here, you can get on or off this bus. You can sit with whoever the fuck you want to sit with. You can move seats. You can get on and off. It doesn't matter. At the same time, nobody's going to fucking give two shits who you are, where you've been, or who you're ever going to be. And he said, but this bus right here that I'm on, it doesn't stop moving. It rolls. He goes, it gets bumpy. He goes, you might not sleep some nights. He goes, you probably probably, or might not ever fucking make it home. <sighs> and, he, and he said, but you're going to sit next to who you're sitting with for the rest of your stay unless you get physically separated from that man. He goes, you're going to work with these men. You're going to play with these men, and you're going to die and live with these men. He goes, you're also going to laugh and make some memories you can never replace. And that's what chokes me up because a lot of these dudes, a lot of my brothers ain't ever coming home. And he said this and, and he's like, but no one will ever forget who you are. Your name in the state of California will stay right here in these books and you'll be remembered. And he stands up and he goes, so what fucking bus you want to get on, oh. boy? And I, my dumb ass, I'm so inspired. Like, By him. you just, like Shakespeare himself just spoke to me. And I was like, fucking hey, homeboy, what, you got a seat for me? And he goes, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. And the other dudes are like, oh, they're looking at each other. And he goes, no, nah, you took too long to answer. He goes, you hey, it could, if it's in you, it's in you. If it's not, it's not. And my career after those words went with those dudes. And there was a lot of good and bad that happened of course and um i made some friendships and memories based off that speech that i can't replace and there's a lot of dudes that i fucking love that are never coming home they will never come home i know what you mean they made choice after choice on top of bad choice but they're such some of the best dudes that i've ate with and i sh took shits with and i've slept with and i sweated with it that i just my heart breaks because they're never coming home and um but it's, it's a history and it's a legacy, the way we live in prison. And I, I feel strongly about it because so many people have been there and they, no, they're not coming home. Of course. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. you're supposed to feel that way because this was your life. Yeah, and I, like, I, it was what was I wanted to life. do until, until I finally was able to break myself out of it when a lot of stuff happened in the joint and I finally got home. I realized how important that stuff was that, that for me, I had to go through to be with these men and to, and to ride with these men. But that for some reason, God, I mean, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm not embarrassed to say it. I also believe in my Viking ancestry. People don't like it, but I, I try to balance it's not it. for everybody. Well, because I have a history in my culture that it's important to me, but I also believe in Jesus. And I, I, I have to say, Jesus had a plan for me to get home. 
Mm-hmm. And and I I was able to be there for a certain time, be a part of something, do something with these men, and then I was one of the lucky ones to come home. That's and right. I take these memories from these men with me, and it's it's hard because I you know I miss them a lot of the times. I miss them, but I my freedom is way more important to me. Well, yes, yeah. I'm sure um, if they had the if they had the option to come home, I'm sure they would come home. You want to know well. the sad thing that I've been talking to my boy Lonely about? Uh, a lot of these guys don't want to come home. And that's sad to hear too, because a lot of these guys are so institutionalized that they're, they're afraid of the real world. I think the reality could be they're afraid and they don't want to. It's easier to live like that. And then there are some people that we've discovered that as a free adult now who pays taxes and works and contributes, we have to also realize that there are some people also who need to be there. There are some people that are not safe to be out here on the streets with us and our family. Oh, yeah. There are some people that I hate to say that cold hearted, not caring. Yeah, they're not. I wouldn't want you around my family. Yes. So that's a reality. No, I, I understand that. No. So you did your whole nine years, you said, right? I did 12. I turned nine years into 12 years, six months oh, because I got okay. involved and was transferred yes. around the state. Every yes. time you get involved in something, you're bounced to the hole no. to another prison. Yeah. I did two shoe terms. I wasn't transferred Tell- to a shoe term. A lot of the times people don't realize you do your shoe terms in the ad seg. Because the shoe term waiting list in my day was a long, yeah. there was a long waiting list to actually be transferred to an actual shoe to Corcoran or the Bay or Tachapi. I did a couple of small shoe terms in the holes. Oh, tell so, us about uh, tell us about those. I loved them because to me, I like to read. I read six thousand. I'm on my six thousand six hundred and seventeen book right now. Oh my god! Read, so you have them counted? Yeah, I have them all too. Oh, that's I would, cool. I would share these books with my friends. I would share them with the homeboys who were interested in reading, but I became selfish because a lot of times, you know, you share books with homies, you come back, their hoods tagged in the book, their area, rip out pages. I, you don't like I that. Just, well, no, books, nice. my mom always, one thing she did was every two weeks, I get a box of five books. Aww. And I read book after book. I read everything from classic literature to war history. I know Aztec culture. I know Jewish culture, black history. I read it all. I wanted to know everything. So I'm pretty fucking sharp when it comes to shit like that. Especially while you're in there and you're like, you know. And I'm absorbing it. And you're in your, and and you when I'm in to. Ad Seg, I'm just working out, eating, and fucking reading. So We didn't have TVs in the hole when I was there. Now they've changed it where yes. you get TV. I didn't have that. So. So the first time, how long did you do in the hole? About two years. Ah. Yeah. So, I mean, it does go, I like guess, you, you know, once you adjust to your daily program, yeah. then it does go faster and faster. It goes fast. Like, like, uh. Uh, again, my homeboy Lonely had shared something where you, you get into a routine to where you're up, your breakfast, you work out, you bird bath, you read for a few hours, you, you write letters for a little bit, and then you then you meditate and calm down for the night. I have a, I like to have a night cup of coffee, and that's a wrap. Okay. Did you have your family? Did your family go visit you? I was very fortunate. My mother traveled around the fucking state of California oh, every other her. week, no matter how far north or how far south I was. Most of my time was done down south, a couple joints up, up, but for the most part, every other week, my mom was there. Did you have Did, girlfriends writing you? I had a couple. You know, it's sad to say, but, you know, I had a couple girls I would talk to. We would try to manipulate to help take care of us and shit, but but I didn't, uh, not really a girlfriend throughout that. My mom. My mom, she rode with me. That's a girl. Yeah. That's right. My best friend. That's right. Yeah. That's, it's it's amazing that we're, that we're here now and we're able to, like, show appreciation to our moms. Well, the best thing I got to show her was that I'm sober. I got married and divorced, but she, yeah, she got to see it. But the point is she got to see me yeah. get married. She got to see me get sober. <laughs> she got to see me get out of prison. She gets to see me stay sober and work in recovery and share my story and help other men. Yeah. So she's got to see all this. You're making her proud. Well, and she's been, she just hit like a year and two months sober too because of everything I went through. So she chose to stop drinking. My mom is now sober at like 75 years old. Oh, well, good. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. good. You know, yeah. it's, it's, we need, we always need that. Like we yeah. need, I, I mean, my mom is my everything. Like everything. Like she's never let go of me. She yeah. never lost faith in me, no matter how bad I was. I know, my mom's the same way. Right? Yeah. We're, we're definitely super blessed. You yeah. know, we're blessed. And maybe that's why we made it. Yeah. Because our parents never lost faith in us. They had a good support system. Yes. Right? And like I tell people all the time, I don't have the story that I grew up in the projects. I grew up lower to middle class white boy in the San Fernando Valley where I'm one of those kids that I was drawn to graffiti. Yeah, you chose what you I chose. I chose it. I watched Boys in the Hood or New Jack City one too many times, <laughs> and I just was drawn to that lifestyle. It's I don't you. have the torn family story. I had a good family. Yeah. So, and it's like what, and it's what I said earlier. If it's in you, it's in you. It doesn't matter. I believe what. that. I believe that some of us are in that, and we're good at it. And if we're fortunate, we get out. If not, we yeah. become a statistic. So you get out after these twelve years. And I struggled with a huge drug addiction. 
Tell us. My crystal meth addiction became worse with heroin in prison. Okay, well, yeah, okay, you know, you got, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I got I involved know. with crystal meth in prison. Now, some of the rules for us in prison, whites, I don't think whites, well, I can speak for us. The whites, we weren't supposed to be doing meth on the yard. If we did it, we had to hide it, and I was hiding it. So you thought you were? Well, yeah, I thought I was. I wasn't probably doing a good job. You know, sunglasses <laughs> on. Sunglasses <laughs> on, even in the cell. You have sunglasses your Sunglasses on, even going to chow hall, like, my eyes are darting everywhere, like, you know, they're, no, not even, they're not even blue anymore. Well, no, yeah, no, they're just huge red suns. And, <laughs> you know, the you know speed, and when you're doing speed in a confined environment like a cell, there's no, there's nothing to tweak on. There's no porn. There's no nothing. What are you doing? Like it was so hard to do speed in jail. But I'm, I had such a problem with meth. I was able to, meth for me was like some people's heroin. I had the worst addiction to meth. I was able to kick heroin way easier than meth. It grabbed the hold of me. I had the even when I would not have it, I would have diarrhea. I would shake. I would. Really? I would have sweats. I would throw up. Yeah, I don't know why it did that, but it did that to me. I would get on heroin just to calm myself down, and I could just drop the heroin like nothing. But meth, oh, my God, it was horrible. It became the biggest battle I fought. And when I paroled home finally in 2013, um, I had such a uh, – I was had major PTSD coming home. I mean, I'm talking like I was washing boxers in the sink, wearing my shower shoes in the shower at my mom's house. She would laugh at me, and I'd be like, yeah, I'm making f- fucking – I'm making Folgers fucking – Instant coffee still, and she's like, "Yo, chill." I still use my Folgers coffee. Yeah, I love it. I still use it. I, I do too. It's a better kick. Yeah, you know when you're used to a cup of coffee <laughs> to let you use the bathroom and get up and start your day. I needed that. Yeah, yeah, and and I came home like that, and then I also came home with a drug problem. I found a drug dealer real quick, and I had them. I had PTSD really bad. I stayed in a room in my mom's house, probably about a year straight on parole, and I had dope brought to me. I had girls brought to me a couple other two a week just to have fun with him. Then they would leave, and I didn't want to leave that room. Oh, you were stuck in your room. I was room. stuck. I was stuck. I turned that room into a jail cell. I decked it out. It was all, I painted it black. It was cool stereo. I hooked up the room and I sat in my window, drank my coffee, did my meth, did projects, looked at porn, whatever the weirdness I could combine, I did it there in that room, in the safety of that room. Uh, how that you, room I wonder how your parents felt. Well, that wasn't the word. It didn't get bad till later. Like they, they were just happy I was home and staying home. They didn't really understand what was happening yet. Okay. And I mean, they knew I had a drug problem, but they didn't really understand the severity of it. And um, that room became my little world. And then as my drug, as the meth on the street changed, because we all know sp- I, it went from amphetamines and speed and P2P dope to crystal meth to now, whatever it is, I'm getting this new shit coming home from prison and it's fucking my head up. It's turning me schizophrenic. It does. That. Yeah, it's turning me schizophrenic. <gasps> I'm accusing my parents of shit. I'm starting to destroy the house. Oh. I think I'm remodeling their million dollar home that they moved to in Santa Clarita. While I was busted, they moved out to Santa Clarita in this bomb-ass five-and-a-half bedroom home. I've now turned this second story of this home into a trap house. I've torn the, I've torn the, there's no more carpet because I think I'm remodeling it. Only the carpet's taken nine months to finish. The floors are destroyed. I've, I'm Tim the Toolman Tweaker Taylor remodeling this home, installing fucking home fans on the staircase, shit that doesn't belong anywhere. I'm thinking I'm upgrading. I'm little by little destroying the home they've moved oh, into. No. They're so scared they don't even go upstairs anymore. They've abandoned their bedroom. They're living on the couch. <gasps> this went on for a while. Oh, I battled a serious drug God. addiction. I battled it. I battled it until finally, to shorten it real quick, one day I had been praying. I had been praying to God and Odin, please take this from me. For like two weeks, I knew... Towards 2018, I'm coming to the end. And I again, back to that one place I told you where I knew I had to quit. Mm -hmm. Something is knocking in my head like this isn't working. Mind you, the drugs are not really working. Yeah, I'm not getting high anymore. I'm not enjoying it. I'm just doing a shot because I think I need to. And it's turning me schizophrenic. I got into a physical fight with my dad because I thought he was fucking my girlfriend who's in another state who I have broken up with a year ago. The insanity in my head that I'm making... So uh, for two weeks, I'm praying on my knees in a dark room. That room that I hooked up has now been destroyed, torn down to a mattress, a sweaty mattress, a little TV with porn on it, uh, some paints that I'm painting a wall that never gets finished painting, some markers, four pairs of clothes in the closet, a candle. I've destroyed the room. I love that you're sharing these stories. Yeah, people need to hear this shit because it's real. The addiction is real. I've The room that I hooked up has now been reverted back to a a, a squatter place where one of these tents homeless people would be living in. It's disgusting. I'm covered in sweat and filth. I can't use the bathroom. Uh, I, I probably weigh 90 pounds and I think I'm sexy taking selfies with this stupid cell phone, searching for <laughs> fucking girls to hook up with on the internet. Like who the hell would want to hook up with me at this point? You know, and, and I'm doing shot after shot of meth and heroin and I'm praying on my knees for two weeks in this dark room. God, 
Jesus, Odin, one of you, please save me. I don't want to do this, but yet I don't know how to stop it either. So I'm stuck in the addiction. The last day, I come to my last day where I did 17 shots of methamphetamine wow. and heroin. I did one, not to be rude and no disrespect, but I did one on the vein on my private and <gasps> it didn't work again. Mind you, the 17 shot was that one. Nothing's working. Nothing is, I'm not even getting high. I'm not even getting schizophrenic. You're just hurting yourself. But I'm injecting. I'm not missing. I'm not missing the vein. I'm going to actually inject. I've injected enough methamphetamine and heroin at this point, more than Kurt Cobain probably did. I could have killed a horse. That much is in my system and it's not doing anything. And I finally come to and I'm like, Wait Like I woke you up. Well, no, I'm like, wait a minute. After I did that last shot on, on my private, I'm like, I've been praying for this. I wasn't smart enough to realize God had already answered my prayer. Like, well, this shit's not working. There you God go. tapped on me and said, hey, motherfucker, this shit, you're done. That's a wrap. You can just continue to inject, but I'm not going to let it hit you anymore. He, he was telling me, I got something else for you to do, and you need to get fucking on point. I got other things for you to do. I need you to hurry the fuck up. Get your shit right, fool. And I'm sitting there, and I realize this, and my, my hair's standing up, and I knocked on my door, and my... And I just said, mom, I'm ready. Please, please. I called for my mom. This little lady comes running up the stairs. She says, are you ready? Let's do it. Aww. And I was just crying. I'm just like, mom, I, I, I don't know how to do it, but I got to do it. I don't want to get high anymore. And I'm crying and she's crying. And she calls this detox. And to get into rehab isn't as easy as people think. I had no, to go on not. a waiting list. I had to get into a detox. And she moves me downstairs onto the couch in her living room, buys me a new TV and a new DVD player. And she says, buys me a bottle of alcohol. And she says, listen, she didn't want me leaving the house. She said, just drink. Like, so I realized I'm just going to drink until I get into detox. So I sit on this couch, watch these movies. I don't know how. I've just walked away from the drugs. I'm just drinking alcohol. For about two weeks, they finally call. We got a bed. Let's get them into Tarzana. I get into the re I get into detox. And there it goes. It started right there. I got active. I went from detox to rehab. I got involved in recovery. I got to sober living. Uh, at that point, I was willing to do whatever the fuck you told me to do. If you wanted me to clean your fucking toilet seven times a day, give me the scrubber. You want me to sweep out your ashes or your butt cans for cigarettes? Do it. I didn't give a fuck. I was exhausted. I was spiritually, mentally, and physically broke with drugs. Drugs kicked my ass worse than gangs in a prison and a county jail did. Wow. It broke me. And I, and I have to admit it. And, no, and at that point, I did whatever they told me. I got a sponsor. I listened. I did my steps. I'm on my third time round doing my steps right now. I did my steps. I share. I do podcasts about recovery. I sponsor oh. guys. I do every fucking thing I can because I don't ever want to go back to that room. And I keep the image of that fucking room and the porn and the candle and the sweaty bed and the dirty clothes. I keep it right here. I don't want to ever go back there again. Uh, you know, I, and it I made me yeah. emotional watching you because I remembered myself feeling yeah. that way as well. Like yeah. when you just don't want to fucking get high, but you just can't stop. Yeah. That, but that's where I was. I didn't know how to stop. I didn't know what to do, but I couldn't stop. Well, yeah. And, and so since then I've been actively involved in recovery and change and all these groups and, uh, good for you. Yeah. yeah. Good for you. Thank you. Do you want to share, do you want to tell them where, you know, somebody that might need help and, you know, might need a sponsor? If you need help or a sponsor, you can hit me up on Instagram because I respond to every damn DM. As long as you're not giving me some weird shit and I get some weird shit, yes. send me a DM if, and I respond to all of them. I check them before I delete them. Uh, I, I, I will help you. I can either lead you to treatment, I can get you in treatment, or if you're just someone who's already working and you need some help, I, I got you because that's what my sponsor And we're definitely going to put your tag, obviously, yeah, thank so you. people know, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's my job to give it back. The only way I can keep it is by giving it back. Good. Good yeah. for you. Um, is there anything else that you would want to share to indict it? Um, I love my history and I love everything I went through. And I like to tell people, someone asked me, would you change anything about it? And I'm like, I mean, I want to say I would, but at the end of the day, if I were to change any of that, whether it be graffiti, gangs, our culture combined, all of our cultures, the Mexican culture, the white culture, the Valley culture, the LA culture, if I were to change any of that that I was raised with and went through, whether it be the shootings, the prison, the stabbings, the drugs, I wouldn't be here right now. I wouldn't be who I am. So it's a crazy journey, but I have to say, think uh, I wouldn't change anything and think about, think about what, you, what, you, what you do and what you do because everything we do leads to another step. Yes. Everything we do from kids, and I know kids don't like to listen and they're hard-headed, but just think about what you're doing because it leads you some scary places. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't come out of those places. Yes. Like my friends, some of my friends that are never coming. Oh, our friends. All of our, our friends, friends that we have that are never coming yes. home. Some of those choices carry serious consequences. Yes. Yeah. 
thank you for coming on Indicted. Thank you guys for having me. It was a I pleasure being here with you guys. Your story. I appreciate yeah. you sharing. You know yeah. your story. Yeah. I um, I don't think I've had anybody. I, have, I don't think I've interviewed anybody that's actually shared ex like a story like yours, like no. you know, telling us how deep they were on drugs and things no. like that. And it's something that I that I like, that I want to hear more about. Yeah. You know, that I enjoy because obviously I'm a I'm an addict too. You know. Yeah. And um, thank you again. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for watching Indicted TV. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and follow us on Instagram.